All right, I think we're all set. Yeah, we're recording. OK. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Word for Word reading series event featuring author Nisi Shaw, who will be addressing a subject of increasing importance and visibility in the literary world. <clears throat> the use of sensitivity readers. Uh, my name is Jacob Powers. I'm the associate dean of the online or of the BA and MA creative writing and I'm here with my colleague Paul Whitcover, associate dean of the online MFA. Um, before we get started, I do have a couple of uh, housekeeping items uh, to run through with you. Uh, today's session is being recorded, so you can avoid being recorded by keeping your microphone on mute and not typing in the chat. And participating in the meeting, unmuting your microphone or participating in the chat means that you are consenting to being recorded. And uh, please do use the chat window to ask questions. We encourage you to submit questions uh, to be addressed during the general Q&A session a little later on. Um, however, due to time constraints, uh, keep in mind that we may not get to every single question. And I am going to turn it over to my colleague Paul now, who will be introducing Nisi. Thanks, Jacob. Um, Jacob and I are thrilled to have author, editor, essayist, and teacher Nisi Shaw as our guest today. Shaw is best known for fiction dealing with gender, race, and colonialism, including Everfair, an alternate history of the Congo, which was a finalist for the 2016 Nebula Award for Best Novel. They're the co-author of Writing the Other, A Practical Approach, a standard text on inclusive representation and the basis of his series of online and in-person workshops. Shawl is a co-founder of the Carl Brandon Society, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting the representation of people of color in the imaginative genres. Their criticism and essays appear widely, including as an introduction to the initial volume on Octavia E. Butler, published by the Library of America. Shawl edited and co-edited Strange Matings, Science Fiction, Feminism, African American Voices, and Octavia E. Butler, Stories for Chip, a tribute to Samuel R. Delaney, and New Sons, Speculative Fiction by People of Color, among other anthologies. Their debut story collection, Filter House, co-won the 2008 James Tiptree Jr. Otherwise Award. Additional awards include the World Fantasy Award, two Locus Awards, and FIA Magazine's Ignite Award. A new story collection, Fruiting Bodies, is forthcoming this autumn from Aqueduct Press, and two more books are due to appear in January of 2023, a second volume of the New Sons anthologies from the UK publisher Solaris, plus Shaw's first middle grade novel, Speculation, from the minority-owned publisher Lee and Lowe. Shaw lives in Seattle, just one block away from a beautiful, dangerous lake full of currents and millionaires. Thank you so much for joining us, Nisi. Thank you. Many thanks. Many thanks to Southern New Hampshire University for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. And to you, to the inestimable Paul Whitcover, <laughs> and to everybody, all the others who have made this event possible. Um, I want to thank my ancestors in particular, who brought me into the world and who helped me learn and teach more and more every day. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you in a minute, but I, before I do, I feel like I have to ask about the lake with, with millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so they're not right in the lake. They're on an island <laughs> in the lake. Um, yeah, I guess I could have been a little more specific about that. Uh, Mercer <laughs> Island, full of millionaires in okay. Lake Washington. Okay, I, I was I was visualizing something more more horrific, maybe. <laughs> Good. <laughs> exactly. All right. So I'm going to uh, step aside and turn it over to you, and then I will come back a little bit later. Okay. So my talk tonight is called "Snowflakes of Steel." Because when a, mar a marginalized community member is taunted for their negative reaction to offensive or hurtful portrayals in fiction, they are called a snowflake. In fiction, actually, or in nonfiction, in real life, uh, there, whenever there's an objection to offensive or hurtful portrayals, 
the person objecting is called a snowflake. So I'm talking about snowflakes of steel. Because the implication of calling someone a snowflake is that they're overly sensitive, they're both fragile and ephemeral. But when we use sensitivity as a tool to better each other's stories, it becomes a strength. I love the image of a snowflake of steel, which I visualize as a sort of literary throwing star or shuriken. Snowflake of steel is my pet name for any sensitivity reader who does the important work of cutting through harmful stereotypes and ignorance to get to the truths our fiction can convey. If you'd like examples of the sort of real world awfulness that can arise from thoughtless, inaccurate representation in fiction, I'll refer you to my essay, How Not to Be All About What It's Not All About, which is up over at Tor.com. Um, I can paste a link to that in the chat if anyone wants to check it out at some point. Um, but that's available to you. Tonight, though, let's focus on preventing that stuff. So the first thing I want to do is define a sensitivity reader. A sensitivity reader, uh, sometimes also referred to as a cultural consultant, is someone willing to review your work for hurtful and clueless content and then create a report outlining what's wrong, what's missing, and often giving you ways to make relevant aspects of your work better. The ideal sensitivity reader has a few important qualities. They're a thorough and thoughtful reader. They have a meaningful connection with the material you want them to review. And they're familiar with the many pitfalls that beset a writer trying to portray characters and settings based on people and cultures beyond that writer's personal background. If the sensitivity reader is also an author themselves, so much the better. My 21-year-old niece attended an extremely white high school for several years. She's Black. She became accustomed to detecting and pointing out her teachers and her fellow students' biased statements and questionable actions. And that skill has st stood her in good stead as a fledgling cultural consultant. By the way, uh, tonight I'm with you to talk about sensitivity readers, but you'll also hear me use the term cultural consultant. I use the terms more or less interchangeably, but if you want to be more precise, cultural consultants can be thought of as a special subset of sensitivity readers. They're focused on the social and community matrices in which your characters operate. While sensitivity readers examine that kind of thing, plus traits more reflective of individual experiences, such as uh, birth order, uh, jobs held, plus, of course, the many potential intersections between all these elements. So that's what I'm calling a sensitivity reader. Next, when to use one. It's always a good idea to employ a sensitivity reader when your fictional milieu differs significantly from the one you're used to living in. And it's especially helpful to get a sensitivity reader's input when your character's identity traits differ significantly from your own. When you are, as I and my workshop co-teachers say, writing the other. The demographic categories that usually prove troublesome are signified by the classic writing the other mnemonic ROARS, R-O-A-A-R-S. That's an acronym standing for race, sexual orientation, age, ability, religion, and sex slash gender. Uh, additional problematic categories can include class, citizenship, and cis slash trans. Uh, anytime your characters fit these categories in ways that you do not fit them, you may want to call on a steel snowflake for help making their representation more lifelike. 
While writers are great observers of human behavior, our fictional depictions of it depend on our experiences. Priorities, nuances, dramatic choices. So many aspects of our literary creations are influenced in a thousand ways by our possession of privileges or by our lack of privileges and by expectations we don't even realize we have. Cultural consultants and sensitivity readers are trained to note the things most of us have trained ourselves to gloss over and to analyze events we ignore or label as normal, such as television show announcers making jokes about the pronunciation of so-called exotic names. You may want to avail yourself of sensitivity readers services more than once on a project. Those of us who work from outlines could conceivably get some benefit out of a sensitivity readers feedback even at that early stage of an outline. If you expect to fold in critiques from beta readers before moving on to your final round of edits, that's also an opportunity for making revisions based on the reports of sensitivity readers. Once all those changes are made, a last review might well be in order too, so as to catch any freshly instituted infelicities, and also to look out for any elements whose impacts are changed by your revamped check text. So again, that's early on, even at the outline stage, when you're going to be getting critiques from beta readers anyway, and after you've revised in line with those remarks. That's at least three opportunities. How do you find a sensitivity reader? This is a very hard uh, question to answer. Um, and it's, it's one that almost everyone asks me. The best way to find a sensitivity reader is via word of electronic mouth is how I would put it. There are websites that advertise the services of sensitivity readers and of cultural consultants, though some of these sites have been known to take large commissions and some of them engage in exploitive practices with their readers. I have a friend who does this work who appears on the Writing Diversely sites directory and she testifies that she's satisfied with their fees and their treatment. So again, I'm going to try and put this, uh, the website for this into the chat so that others have a chance to check it out. The website again is called Writing Diversely. There may be others too operating fairly. This is just one I know because of a personal connection. So there are websites still inquiring among your acquaintances, your person in person and online acquaintances that can also yield good results. And personal requests for help that draw on wider pools of experts also come with the added punch of your reputation and the reputational weight of those you ask to pass them along to you. Even putting out a general post about your needs using Twitter or some other social media app to broadcast it, that can net you some promising leads on ways to get those needs met. You will be hunting for people whose backgrounds are closer matches than your own to the backgrounds of the others you're portraying, of course. You, you, that pretty much, you probably figured that out on your own. But you should also be on the watch for those whose backgrounds, though not an exact match for your material, include experience with issues of inclusion and issues of representation in general. Often they'll be able to pick out problematic passages you wouldn't expect them to see. For instance, uh, I was once asked 
to examine a character in a comic book whose author suspected that the character was a magical Negro. Uh, so I should explain that a magical Negro is a common fantasy stereotype of a magically powerful Black person who places all their gifts at the disposal of the story's white hero. It's, um, there are, there are whole essays written about this thing. It, it really does happen. Uh, one good example is um, coffee in Stephen King's story, The Green Mile. Coffee, who is able to bring people back from the dead, and yet all he does is help out the white guard that's the real hero of the story. So I was being asked to look at this character because the author thought that perhaps the character was a magical Negro. I had no problems with that character, but I called out another in the script of that comic as a magical gypsy. Uh, the latter character traveled all over Europe, obtaining ingredients for the white hero's potions without any benefit that I could see to themselves. They just did this so that the potion would have the ingredients. I am not Romani, which is the actual accepted term for this ethnic group. I'm not Romani. But I've seen enough racial stereotypes and enough instances of that one in particular, the magical Negro, to be able to spot it in action no matter what background. So again, someone who has some experience with this sort of work or experience with this sort of with this concept is going to be helpful. In your inquiries for sensitivity readers, you should always mention the nature of the text you want help with. Uh, the genre, the length, is it a uh, comic? Is it um, a play? Is it uh, 100 pages? Is it, you know, 500 pages? Uh, and also, um, what sort of perspectives you lack? Um, say that you don't have the perspective of someone who's been adopted, for example, or you don't have the perspective of a Pacific Islander. And you should always mention the deadline you'll need input by. And you should emphasize your willingness to pay for the work in one way or another. A word of caution, don't try to cut corners by giving your cultural consultant just part of the text you're working on. I mean, maybe you're only concerned about a specific interaction or you're only concerned about one character's speech patterns but there could very likely be other issues. As I mentioned just a moment ago, when working as a sensitivity reader for an author who suspected she had perpetrated a magical Negro, I spotted something wrong with an entirely different character. So give your steel snowflake free range over all your imagined story world. Trust them to let you know what you need to know even when you didn't realize that you needed to know it. Uh, let's see, what are they going to look out for? Uh, as I was saying, you should put together a letter to accompany your manuscript, um, detailing to your cultural consultant the sorts of things you're concerned about, whether you don't have the background or the experience that you'd like to have. Um, but you should also recognize, of course, that you won't necessarily have a firm idea of all the problems your work may contain. In general, a sensitivity reader, reader will zero in on action, dialogue, and description that hues closely to stereotypes connected to the demographic categories you depict. Drunken Indians they'll be looking out for, genius autistics, violently fanatical Muslims, lonely, doomed, tormented homosexuals, and so on. 
Do all your black characters die? Is every member of a drug dealing gang a stand in for a different, different ethnic group? Finding and recognizing troubling patterns like these in your work is what you'll be paying your steel snowflake for. So what to pay them? When I mentioned to my critique group that I was writing this speech, one member wanted me to instruct you to pay double what you'd pay a regular consultant because this works so emotionally draining. That is what they said. And it's true, there's no meaningful way to compensate someone for the psychological pain of steeping yourself in someone else's ill-conceived depiction of you and your community. Even if that depiction isn't intended to be hurtful, it still can be. But along with giving a sensitivity reader the going rate, you can offer them further benefits. Uh, that going rate, by the way, is subject to variation. There are some who charge a flat fee for their services and some who invoice by the hour, by the page, by the character that you've developed, by the chapter, and so on. There's one sensitivity reader of my acquaintance who charges a fee of $300 for a novel up to 75,000 words. And then she adds another $10 for each additional thousand words. Short story fees are more typically one flat amount, though that amount can range between 50 and $100. There are also ways to pay without paying directly to the sensitivity reader, and you can explore these with whoever you find. Um, you can make donations to a charity, um, you can uh, offer your services in some other area. Um, you may be able to provide a sensitivity read in one area that someone else needs. So you can do uh, like mutual sensitivity reads. Uh, if you're paying money, uh, sometimes these fees may be higher than the pay you anticipate re receiving as the novel or the story's author. In such cases, you should regard the money spent as an investment in the future of your career as an inclusive storyteller. It's money spent towards learning. It's part of your uh, educational fees. In addition to paying your sensitivity reader the money that they bill you for, if they do promptly and in full, be certain to pay attention to what they tell you. I recently was asked to vet a manuscript, which I happened to know because the writing community is a small one. I happened to know had already been reviewed by at least four other cultural consultants, four others. Every one of these had advised the author asking for their help to drop the novel due to its offensive and hurtful premise. And every one of those four had been ignored as the author sought out the approval of yet another of their colleagues. This struck me as hilarious, <laughs> but also disre disrespectful. I, while it's often useful to get more than one opinion of your work because no one has a monopoly on, you know, exactly how a culture works. Angling over and over again, though, for its validation, that's that's just ridiculous. So respect your sensitivity reader. Listen to what they have to tell you concerning the issues you asked them to address. And also listen concerning any others you didn't realize needed addressing. Opinion is divided on whether to credit your sensitivity reader when your work is published, either in acknowledgments or uh, a bio that you publish with a short story. You respect 
and you use your ability to listen once again. Simply ask your cultural consultant what they'd prefer. Do they want to be credited or not? You're not obligated to name or acknowledge anyone, but in my opinion, you are obligated not to mention them if that's what they want. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to process a steel snowflakes report. And again, I'm going to emphasize you got to pay attention to the points your sensitivity reader is making. Don't poo poo their conclusions as unimportant nonsense. Don't blame them for not understanding what you really meant to say. Believe them when they tell you that your Mulan analog would never willingly show the soles of her feet to her guests. Change your manuscript accordingly. If you have multiple sensitivity readers, either all at once or over different parts of the project, collate their reports for easier application to your work. Go through and, you know, line up where they fall in the story. If the input you receive from them is contradictory or confusing, you can ask for clarification, but you should be willing to bear the ultimate responsibility for whatever appears on your pages. When readers of the finished book find fault with what you've done, as almost always happens, impress on those readers the fact that you've been trying your best to listen and learn how to improve and that you remain ready and willing to do so the next chance you get. Finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how to become a cultural consultant, how to become a sensitivity reader, and then we'll have a long period for questions. So maybe I've been inspiring you to reevaluate your own areas of diversity expertise. Maybe. If you're up for offering access to them to the rest of us, you can start by noting this on your author website. You do have an author website, right? Note it on your author website. Mention it to your author friends. At first, you should be prepared to accept assignments paying little or maybe nothing, because that's how you build a resume and how you collect client recommendations. Uh, you can review the reports that you've received on your own writing for tips on how to construct similar reports for others. If you count a sensitivity reader among your friends, you can get their tips for how to do this too. The Writing Diversely website that I mentioned earlier is currently closed to listing new sensitivity readers in their directory. But that may change, or you may find another similar venue. As I said, there are many out there. Meanwhile, you can schedule yourself when others approach you. Just do it for yourself. Or when you learn via your classmates or your social media outlets or your website's visitors that your services are needed. If you'd like to know more about the sorts of errors cultural consultants look for, the sort of rotting stereotypes and moribund microaggressions that steal snowflakes cut away, I recommend that you read Writing the Other, A Practical Approach that I co-wrote with Cynthia Ward. I recommend you read that if you haven't yet, or read it again if you have read it and do the exercises that, I and, that Cindy and I put together for you. Also, check out the resources and classes available at the writingtheother.com website. The classes cost money, but there are scholarships. The resources on that website are free. Uh, it's writingtheother.com. Let me see if I can put that in the chat also. It's pretty easy to remember, right? Writingtheother.com. Um, and you can ask me things. Uh, right now, while I'm here and 
in the streaming event because I'm here for you. I'm really, really grateful that you're listening to me and that you're willing to learn that you're so brave. Thank you. And please ask away. That's all Thanks. I have to say for now. <laughs> Thanks, Nisi. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pop back in. And um, students, the, the uh, or attendees, rather, the, the chat is open. And if you have um, questions you'd like us to, to pose on your behalf, uh, Tanisi, please feel free to type them in there. I have a few questions lined up uh, to get us started. Um, I'm going to begin by immediately going off script. Because uh, one thing that was really fascinating to me in listening to your presentation just now was the similarities and yet profound differences between editorial work and the work that a um, sensitivity reader would do. It seems like it would be very important not to confuse the one and the other. How do you think of the differences between them? So when I work as an editor, um, all I'm focusing on is how to get the story that the author is trying to tell in, into shape that everyone will see what they're doing with it. Um, that is my primary focus. Um, I think about things uh, it, at, at the tiniest level, you know, of punctuation. Um, I, I think about... Um, the flow and that kind of stuff. When I'm working as a sensitivity uh, reader, as a steel snowflake, I, I'm thinking Love that about. Term. Thank you. I I uh, I'm thinking about um, how people can can misunderstand them. Um, how people, so so in that it's it's similar, but uh, how people can. Think about think about what they're saying in uh, in in ways that again they may not have intended or that they may have intended well. Um, uh, always w watching out for the categories that I mentioned. Um, people who are of a different religious background and stuff. I you know I mean. <sighs> I, I, it's more about the content and less about the form, I think, to, to sum it up. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating because I feel as though this, this new uh, editorial um, uh, area of expertise is kind of taking shape. Um, Right, kind of before our eyes over the last uh, over the last few years, um, yeah, and it's still kind of finding its uh, its its place and its its boundary, establishing its boundaries and learning how how best it can um, function within you know the the larger literary uh, establishment. Um, but I think it, it's also done extremely well in establishing its you know its raison d'etre, you know, that it, it, it that it, it doesn't have to justify its presence anymore. It's proved <laughs> it's you. it's proved its use, I think. Yeah, I'm I'm still hoping that um, there will be at this point, I, there are a few publishing houses that uh, will have sort of in-house cultural consultants um, or they'll have um, like I've been approached by um, the people who put out games um, to to uh, you know to read and and make remarks on how they've they've set up their their non gaming character their non player characters um, for instance uh, and uh, there have been a few other publishers not ever, but it's not it's not par for the course it's just some people are doing it, and I'm very happy about that. I'm going to pull, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to pull a, a question from the chat, and then I'll probably throw in some of my own again later. But I think this is a, a wonderful question from Sophie, uh, who, who says, first of all, it's lovely to meet you, and mm -hmm, goes on you. to say, I'm deeply interested to know how can an edgy 
Walk the Line, Generation X slacker author remain controversial while also maintaining a level of sensitivity? Well, I think that um, controversy is actually, there's all kinds of controversy. And um, when I think of the edginess as opposed to the edge lords, um, <laughs> that's when I'm that's when I'm sure that I'm right. So um, I actually believe that controversy it can be generated by being extremely sensitive, <laughs> for instance, um, and that uh, the, the kind of controversy that I'm talking about is when you are well, in, in comedy, they talk about punching up and punching down. Are you uh, are you being controversial in ways that would upset people who are in power? Or are you being controversial in ways that would upset people who are disenfranchised? And um, if you're a Generation X slacker author who is going for the jugular of uh, people in power, you got it made. <laughs> um, let me ask kind of a, a related question to that. Um, I'm thinking about genres or writers who are uh, writing in genres, such as the ones that are um, are featured in the MFA program here at Southern New Hampshire University, which are speculative fiction, romance, um, and specifically stuff like fantasy, um, you know, science fiction, space operas, or even kind of capital R romance. If you're writing about, say, aliens with multiple shifting genders, where would you go for a sensitivity reader and would you need one? Uh, yeah, you sure would. I mean, I think everybody does. Come on. Uh, but um, <laughs> you would... I am personally someone who uh, I identify as gender fluid. So, you know, you would definitely want to find someone who has experience living a gender fluid life to help you out with, with aliens whose gender shifts. Um, you might also find it uh, helpful to talk with someone who is... Um, who has undergone some sort of uh, shift in gender presentation, for instance, um, who was assigned female at birth and uh, has come out as male. So um, though that's only a one way shift to for, between one part one and one part of a, a wide spectrum wide field, to another part, it, it still involves that transition. So yeah, that's who I would go with. That's that's really interesting. I mean, because it 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 shows. I think you illustrate really well that what at first blush might seem to be completely divorced from any relationship to a real world scenario in which the services of a sensitivity reader or cultural consultant could be useful. In fact, is a lot closer uh, than you know than it might appear. Because sure. there's in, insight, to, useful insight to be gleaned to um, to uh, to establish the authenticity of however uh, imaginative a uh, speculative leap you're trying to make in your work. I mean, I guess it all comes down to an attempt to achieve some kind of authenticity in the end. Yeah, and connection too. To achieve some sort of connection, um, a connection because, with um, a connection with who? A connection uh, between uh, the author and their subject, and between the audience and what they find in the author's writing. Because I'll tell you, I'm as as a writer, I'm coming increasingly to realize that there's the story that I write, and then there's the story that you read, and those are different. Those those damn readers. <laughs> um, Jacob, do you have some some questions you'd like to chime in with as well? 
Well, yeah, uh, there was one that popped up uh, uh, pretty soon after the one that you had read, Paul, that I thought was of interest, um, specifically with creative nonfiction and and the lines that are drawn um, there, because, you know, with fiction, it's you know, you try to create these stories from nothing and you want those sensitive readers to um, to to be able to uh, read through these materials and stuff and offer that that feedback. Does it differ with creative nonfiction or what what? Um, should a, a student who is majoring in that particular concentration keep in mind when writing the other? Do you see any other like um, characteristics that go to transcend the fiction genre, I suppose? Or with, maybe for that matter, screenwriting or, or poetry as well, uh, our three other, uh, or our two other concentrations here? So um, in fiction, people may think they're right, they're making it all up, but they're not. <laughs> And so actually uh, someone who is doing creative nonfiction has uh, an advantage there because you know that you are basing it on what you, you've you experienced and what your surroundings. Um, that's the only difference that I can see is that uh, someone who is doing creative nonfiction may be more aware of, of the interaction between the material and their biases. Otherwise, same thing. I think that's a good thing to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it transcends all genres. It's something that, that one should keep in mind um, constantly. Um, and to that point, uh, there is another question here. Uh, um, can, should one become a sensitivity reader if they are only able to offer a couple of hyper-specific perspectives. And in this case, this uh, uh, particular uh, guest wrote, uh, a white individual who is an abuse survivor only being able to offer the perspectives in, of an abuse survivor since they did not belong to any other other group or minority group. Like, can, can a person, in other words, who is a white person who has survived um, abuse before become a sensitivity reader that hyper focused of a sensitivity reader, and are there any, I guess, barriers to that that one should consider? I absolutely think that that's possible, and I also think that uh, the experience of doing that again can aid you in finding uh, other problems. Uh, definitely. Um, so I would, I would start out by you know saying I I have these specific areas of expertise and offering the, them to people. Um, but I would not rule out the possibility of developing other areas of sensitivity. There's also this, okay? Uh, I am 66 years old and I have been teaching, writing the other material for decades. My identification with groups outside the dominant paradigm with non-mainstream groups has changed. It has grown. Um, I am no longer middle-aged. Uh, I am obese. Uh, I have developed uh, disabilities. I, I have glaucoma. I have fibromyalgia. So um, again, if you are learning about doing this and you only have one area of expertise at this point, Recognize that that can change. I think that's also a very uh, important point to keep in mind for, for those who are uh, pursuing those uh, positions as a sensitivity reader that, you know, life life goes on, <laughs> things do change, right? Yes. Yeah. So thank, thank you so much for that. Um, folks, and if you do have any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, Paul, did you have any uh, follow up that you wanted to ask at all, or? I did. I I, I did have one. Um, thanks. Um, I, I'm interested in the in the idea of becoming a sensitivity reader. Um, if I if that were something that I wanted to pursue or anyone wanted to pursue, rather than just hanging my shingle out, um, where would I go to to learn the necessary skills to practice sensitivity? reading, I guess you would say, in, in, a, in a professional manner that would be useful to my clients and uh, would be um, something that I could be, uh, could take a professional pride in. 
Well, um, so many ways that you could go about this, actually. I, I, um, I can recommend a few. Um, you would probably want to talk with other people who are doing this. Um, and and um, they might possibly ask you to help them out with smaller projects, um, with things that are two or three pages, say, and then review th what you have done. So they might talk about it with you and eventually take you on as, um, oh, I'm sorry, what's, what's the word? Um, I want kind of an, as, as an apprentice almost apprentice. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. as an apprentice, um, you should also practice it yourself um, with published pieces. Um, it's easier to see what's going on if you use someone else's work. <laughs> yeah. So I would say not to do it with your own work, but to look at something that is published and analyze it uh, in terms of, you know, are, is this representative? Is this problematic? You know, um, how much of this is balanced by other qualities in the manuscript, that sort of thing. Um, and then practice it on, preferably on something that has been published. Right. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, you, you someone might be a, a, a published writer who is also a sensitivity reader and think to themselves, well, I don't need a sensitivity reader because I am one. But they, uh, what I'm getting from uh, from your presentation is that that's very much not the case. It is not. Uh, I will use an example of, uh, I wrote a short, a piece of flash fiction in which I had uh, one of the characters use a pseudo Jamaican pseudo Caribbean swear word um, they called they, they called they exclaimed a uh, blood clot um, and what they were in the subsequent story you could tell that they were talking about a clot but the real derivation of this is cloth Mm. Uh, and so this was pointed out to me by someone of Caribbean background, someone that I did not have. So I had to make sure and point out in the story that this character did not know where where this where the derivation of this word came from. Um, I had to like sort of make sure that. I guess you, you call it lampshading it. Make sure that that um, it was a sign that this character was not as hip as he thought. But I would not have known that without mm -hmm. a sensitivity reader who had a different background than my own. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, let me let me grab another question out of the chat, or actually, I'll turn it over to Jacob to do that. Oh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so. Uh, one of our guests had a follow up actually with the creative writing question again, and I think um, I'll, I'll try to articulate it uh, the way that I, the way I'm interpreting it is that um, they're asking about writing about subject matter that is stereotypical in, in, in its own way. So in this case, um, the guest is saying I'm a bit of a stereotype myself when it comes to autism, which is probably why I was so diagnosed. So would it be wrong to include these stereotypical stories, in, in, even if it's not in line with the sensitivity ideals, like how how does one go about uh, sharing stories where the stereotype tends to be true to them because I, I that's just their personal experience uh, uh, without without overstep. You, does that make sense? Well, yeah, it's the idea that um, stereotypes are based in some to some extent in the truth mm -hmm. um, and also that uh, our experiences are necessarily anecdotal rather than statistical, right? You know, um, this is what happened to me. Um, if there is room, it is always helpful to have this, um, have more than one example. 
Okay. So, um, you know, maybe um, I, I spoke about having a drunken Indian. So maybe there is someone who is of Indian heritage and they have a drinking problem. But not every Indian in there is an alcoholic and not every alcoholic in the story is an Indian. So um, if it's not an isolated and exclusive representation that can help balance it. Okay. Uh, uh, could, the it right, could the writer also just acknowledge it in, in a way too, and just say like, you know, I, I understand that this sounds like a stereotypical story because it is one that is often, you know, conveyed as such, but it is one that I have experienced personally or something like that. Is that, is that a way to also kind of um, navigate that without, like it's it certainly would help and okay. but then the other thing is um part of the problem with stereotypes is not just that they you know repeat harmful tropes but that they do it um they make them arbitrary and um so the first thing i was talking about was uh getting at their ability to be like the one truth. Uh, and then the other thing that you can do is um, question what caused this, you know, and, and um, examining that and making that examination part of the depiction. Does that make sense? I'm sure hoping that helps. I think so, yeah, I, I, think, I think that, um addresses it and 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 kind of in a uh, I guess I don't know if it's a similar vein <laughs> I guess it all is because it's all about sensitivity reading reading and stuff but um the, the follow another question from a um a guest is that you know they're curious like what are the limitations of being a sensitivity reader like if you are someone who's a spouse or a parent of someone who has a sensitive matter, such as adoption or abuse or something uh, like that, but that person hasn't experienced it themselves personally, only mm. except through their spouse or their parent or whatever the case may be, can they become a sensitive reader for that particular topic? Is that a thing? I would say no. Um, I would say um, what that person can do is be a sensitivity reader uh, who understands the role of allies in your work or parents or spouses, um, but it's not the same as being the one experiencing that difference. Um, I was married for many years to a white man and uh, he had a different experience of racism than I did. He would be in like you know, some factory and they and people would start telling racist jokes. That did not happen to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was uh, something that he could have. He could have uh, been a cultural consultant about. He could not have been a cultural consultant about my life. Thank you. Um... I think uh, there there is one more question. The line between stereotypes and realism. Um, so, for example, the systemic injustices in the U.S. can lead to a similar unfortunate outcomes for certain groups um, and, and stuff like that. So, so I guess in this particular question, you know, is 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 there a clear line between that stereotype and realism, or is it one that is in terms of sensitivity reading that that one should recognize, or is there I guess I, I guess I'm trying to follow the question myself here. <laughs> um, so um, I, there's a couple right. of things I want to say about that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think I've got it because I'm looking right. at the question in the chat also. Okay. Um, so there, in your fiction, you are not necessarily being utterly realistic. Sometimes you are being optimistic and sometimes you are being hopeful. Uh, so if you're um, writing about, uh, again, taking from my uh, speech, the example of like, you know, everyone who is homosexual in this novel um, dies horribly. Um, you know, again, that may be based on your 
your real experience. You know, you may have seen many, many suicides, many, many, you know, beatings to death, uh, poisonings, whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's what you want to represent. It's not a stereotype um, that you're avoiding. It's pessimism. Um, so there's that. Uh, also, again, um, I I uh, I really feel this because I have had a story where someone was like asking me, "Why did what did he what did this person do? Why are the cops after him?" And I'm like, uh, "Because they could be after him because like all the males in my family." are, you know, have been incarcerated or in, are in danger of it. So uh, again, that's uh, that's realistic. Um, but I didn't write a story about everybody in my family being in jail. I wrote a story right. about a kid who is immortal <laughs> and um, is shot by cops and lives. I like what I like that. You know, it, it, not a stereotype, but the focusing on the pessim pessimism aspect of it that you had mentioned yeah. and stuff that 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 resonates well um, for me. Um, well, thank you so much, and and for those uh, asking questions and and as well that these have been wonderful. Um, Paul, did you have any closing thoughts or questions that you wanted to share? Or? Uh, I'm going to throw throw a tough one at Nisi just to to close this out. Just uh, <laughs> to make it gonna, easy on her, <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot um, because uh, I'm I'm a big fan of your work, and I I want to plug your your novel Everfair, uh, which which I mentioned in my introduction. Before I go, this is a sprawling um, uh, epic uh, of of uh, alternate history that um, that engages across a number of different. Um, areas of diversity, um, it, 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 it kind of deconstructs um, steampunk as a genre, uh, exploring the kind of colonial underpinnings of it. It, it, it interrogates the idea of the utopian novel. Um, I know that it, it was published in 2016. It was a little bit kind of before the current wave of sensitivity readers and sensitivity reading, but I'm wondering, did you use sensitivity readers for that book is there is there something is there a way you could have used them if you if you didn't based on your current perspectives? I certainly could have, um, and um, I'm going to be using them for the sequel, Kinning, oh, that yes. I've been working on now. Oh, I'm excited! Yeah, to hear I really that. need them. Yeah, <laughs> no, because uh, I have had feedback uh, which leads me to believe could have used it. Okay, but I'll try and get it for the next one. And and when when is that? When do you anticipate the the next one coming out? I really don't know. It needs a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I turned in a draft uh, a couple of months ago. I'll be hearing back from the editors, and then, you know, there'll be more revisions for sure. Okay. Well, that just gives our guests uh, time to read Everfair if they haven't already, so that they'll be ready for the sequel. All right. Kinning. <laughs> it's called Kinning. All right. Excellent. <laughs> So um, that brings us to the end of our uh, wire, of our word for word for tonight. And I want to thank uh, my co-host Jacob and all of our guests and a special thanks to Nisi Shaw, uh, an incredible writer and teacher who we're very honored to have with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. Yes, thank you. And um, we're so glad you were able to join us and invite you to our next lookout uh, for future word for word events. Um, our next one is actually a graduate spotlight event, which is scheduled for June 15th at 8 p.m. And will feature readings from graduates of the BA, MA and online MFA creative writing programs. So keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope this is very helpful for you. And thank you again, Nisi. And uh, everyone have a wonderful evening.